Okay, so uh, I will go on now with uh, some data on illiterate adults. And in fact, I'm very lucky to be the second one to talk because Gislaine, in fact, I had a hard job to explain a lot of you know, basic uh, concepts, complicated brain areas, complicated experiments. And now the beginning of my talk will be quite similar, uh, although uh, it will be with illiterate adults. So let's look. First, look at what is changed uh, in the way we process oral language when we learn to read. So I present rapidly uh, the main um, uh, results uh, of a huge study we did on uh, Brazilian and Portuguese illiterates with uh, Stanislas Dehaene and uh, Gislaine Dehaene and uh, José Moraes, and of course in collaboration with uh, Brazilian and Portuguese uh, uh, labs, in particular uh, with Lucia Braga in Brasilia and with Paulo Ventura in Portugal. And in that study we had an auditory part uh, basically with two tasks. One which actually was not a task, it was merely passive listening to spoken sentences. And the other one is a very classic uh, task in psycholinguistic, which is auditory lexical decision. So you are hearing uh, a lot of expression and you only have to decide whether each of these, uh, these expressions are, uh, is or not uh, a word of your language, in this case, of course, Portuguese. And in both tasks, what we observed was a, a massive enhancement of the response of that famous area that uh, Gislaine already talked about, the planum temporale, in literate people compared to illiterate people. And when I speak about literate people, that was not only the case in people like you and me, which means people that uh, attended school as children, but also what we call ex-illiterates, which mean people who exactly as illiterate never attended school in childhood, but benefited from special uh, literacy classes as adults. And so they have exactly the same, uh, say, life history and socio-economical and cultural background as illiterates, except that they learn to read as adults. And so both in ex-illiterates and in literates, we observe, you see the uh, upper lines, a very huge enhancement of activation in that region that we know to host phonological representations. Now, which uh, kind of phonological representation exactly are changed by literacy is a matter of debate, but we know from a famous work by uh, José Moraes that illiterate adults uh, have huge difficulties in tasks where they have to explicitly manipulate speech sounds. Like, for example, deleting the first phoneme of an expression, like uh, deleting the M in Moza, or the reverse task, adding a phoneme at the beginning of an expression. And this is the case specifically for literate people, people who became literate in an alphabetic system and not in people that acquired um, a non-alphabetic system, like, for example, a Chinese, where you can see that literate people um, are as poor as illiterates, in fact, because they don't need to learn these explicit, rep explicit representations. So why has, are these results relevant for dyslexia? Well, uh, they are relevant because compared, as you can see, compared to controlled uh, um, children with developmental dyslexia are also presenting anomalies in the level of activity uh, in the planum temporale, and Gislaine commented about that. Now, if we observe the same results in people who remained, in adult people, who remained illiterate for strictly socio-economic reason, this means that this 
abnormal, let's say, a pattern of activation is not a cause of dyslexia, but rather a consequence of poor reading level or, of course, an illiterate absent reading level. So it's exactly the kind of situation that uh, Frank Ramus mentioned uh, at the beginning of the afternoon, that you don't have to make an interpretation, a causal interpretation of um, activation difference between dyslexics and non-dyslexic because it can always be a consequence of their impairment. Now, uh, another difference that we observed at the level of language was the emergence of response to spoken uh, words in the visual system, which means that uh, the visual word from area, as already mentioned in children also by Ghislaine, begins to respond to spoken words. So this is a top-down effect. When you are literate and you listen to spoken words, in fact, you automatically activate uh, uh, sp the spelling of these words. It's of course a totally unconscious process. It might be at least unconscious. You don't need to want to do that, but anyway, you do it. But this, is, this was the case, in fact, in an active task like auditory lexical decision. We didn't observe that in, in passive listening, but anyway, in auditory lexical decision, we saw that in literate people, there is this kind of you know, feedback from spelling to uh, oral language, let's say, in terms of brain activation. And this corresponds nicely to a lot of uh, behavioral uh, data uh, showing that there are orthographic effects in spoken word processing. Uh, both in tasks involving metaphonological representations, for example, in rhyme judgment, we know that literate uh, people listening to spoken words will be uh, slower, for example, to decide that two words like toast and ghost rhyme than to decide that two words like ring and king rhyme because in the first pair you have a difference in orthography. So they are congruent, of course, at the phonological level, they are rhyming, but they are incongruent at the orthographic level and this affects the uh, speed of their response. Uh, thanks to the work by uh, Johannes Ziegler, we also know that orthography, orthographic representation, internal representation, affects processing in recognition tasks, purely auditory recognition tasks, like auditory lexical decision. So when you have to decide that uh, spoken utterance is a word or not, you will be slower for words that can be uh, written, which rhyme, sorry, can be written in different ways, like for example, deep, than two words including a rhyme uh, that has only one possible spelling in your language. Uh, and so it's uh, not only you know, a cognitive late effect because you already observe that in recognition task. What about dyslexic? Well, orthographic effects in dyslexic, it's in fact debated because uh, some work also by uh, Joe Ziegler show that uh, only skilled readers show orthographic effects in online recognition tasks. But if you look at metaphonological tasks, there you have very different results according to the studies. And in fact, it might be the case that um, some dyslexic children might use their orthographic representation, although they might be poor, but even so, they might use them to supplement their uh, poorly, uh, let's say, their poor phonological abilities. So in some studies, you, don't, you have less orthographic influence in dyslexic compared to normally reading children, but in other studies, dyslexic show stronger orthographic effects because they use this uh, uh, knowledge strategically. Now, uh, what is changed in the way we process uh, the visual inputs when we learn to read? So uh, Ghislaine already explained you the mosaic in the ventral system where you have 
uh, the words, let's say, in between, you know, the tools and the face system, let's say, to be simple, and that there might be some competition effect between the uh, recognition of visual words and the recognition of faces in particular. And using a similar, uh, not uh, identical, but very similar uh, situation as the one she used with children, but this time with the illiterate, ex-illiterate, or, li illit or literate, sorry, adults, we observed exactly the same kind of competition effects. So what we did observe is that prior to reading acquisition, the visual word from area, in fact, responds mostly to faces. As you can see here, the line on the top with the uh, user activation are the illiterate, so they present a much stronger response to faces compared to literate people in the left hemisphere, but there is kind of switch from the left to the right hemisphere, and if you look at the responses in the, let's say, mirror um, uh, area in the right hemisphere, then you can see the reverse, that the uh, literate people present more activation. So it is like if uh, there is no room for everybody there, and if you are learning to read, then please faces go on the right side. So that's quite a simplification, of course, but it was uh, quite a strong effect, and uh, it corresponds nicely to the recycling, uh, neural recycling theory proposed by Stanislas Dehaene. So uh, again, what's the relevance for dyslexia? Well, uh, the, it's that the difference between dyslexic children and normal readers in face lateralization with response to faces more right lateralized in normal than impaired readers, as reported by uh, Monsalvo and uh, Gislaine and others, might be a consequence rather than a cause of, rather than a cause of the reading deficit. Now, uh, apart from this um, competition, neural competition effect between written words and faces, it's important to emphasize that the main effect is literacy is in fact, on the visual system is in fact a positive effect with a large enhancement of responses uh, to all visual categories this time uh, in, uh, the, at the occipital uh, level. So uh, it's kind, as a refinement of visual analysis uh, that literacy affords uh, to literate people compared to illiterates. And recently we observed also this time using evoked, evoked potential uh, that uh, there is the same kind of, uh, uh, let's say, correlation between let literacy and visual discriminability, so the capacity the capacity to discriminate between uh, different visual, visual non even non-linguistic objects is enhanced in literate compared to illiterate people. Uh, another effect which is uh, often debated is the problem of mirror image discrimination, uh, which was debated uh, for a long time as being a specificity of dyslexic children. And in fact, what we observed is that acquiring literacy also improves mirror image discrimination. In fact, uh, literacy, uh, at least in the Latin alphabet, conflicts with one characteristic, basic characteristic of the visual system, which is mirror invariance. Indeed, the ventral part of the visual system uh, evolved mainly, of course, for object recognition, independently of object orientation, because it's not very useful to, for, to recognize that a tiger is a tiger uh, if it's turned left or right. But, of course, learning to read in our alphabet requires unlearning this mirror invariance because you have mirror letters, like, uh, for, for example, D and B, and so words that differ only by these letters, be it at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end, and you also have palindromic words like was and so. 
Now, how do we unlearn mirror invariance? Well, the answer seems trivial, but it's precisely to reading acquisition. If we compare uh, illiterate to ex-illiterate or literate people, we see that illiterates are very poor at discriminating mirror images of objects, even of real objects. Uh, the same results are observed for other stimuli like faces or like uh, geometric shapes. And this is uh, specific for mirror uh, image stimuli. So for example, discriminating, I cannot see from here, this from that, I think, but not for rotation in the plane, which would be uh, that uh, pair. Uh, again, recently using evoke, uh, uh, ERPs, uh, we observed the same uh, kind of effect that literacy improves mirror, dis uh, mirror discrimination and that this effect is observed in a very early time window. So if you present two objects, uh, the effect is, also, is already observed at uh, around 100, 148 milliseconds uh, after the onset of the second stimulus, which is quite uh, an early effect. And as you can see here, the effect is correlated uh, with the reading scores uh, obtained by our adult subjects. Again, this is relevant for dyslexia because, uh, as I told you, it was highly debated whether mirror discrimination or uh, troubles with mirror discrimination could be a cause of dyslexia. And this shows, these results show clearly that maybe in some dyslexic it might be a specific cause, but in many cases it might be rather a consequence of uh, poor reading or lack of training with uh, written stimuli. Because, precisely because again, illiterate adults show exactly the same effect. Now, this is not always the case. There might be some differences in visual processing between illiterate adults and dyslexic children. And I would like to present you only one example to leave some time for discussion and questions. And it's about uh, written specific visual processes, and in particular, pro specific processes linked to the concept of uh, crowding, which was already presented by Joe Ziegler uh, this afternoon. So the notion that we visual word, while they are very crowded stimuli because the letter in the space, I mean physical space, they are very close uh, one to each other. And so we have to process these, uh, this uh, difficult material and there are many data showing that we most probably develop a specific uh, process to do that and I am uh, thinking uh, mainly about the work by Jonathan Granger. Uh, what we did is using a specific uh, situation to um, explore a context effect which is conceptually linked with this notion of crowding. We knew from the literature that uh, recognition in the same very simple, same different task where you see f a first letter and then a second one, uh, there is what is called a congruence effect, which means more rapid uh, uh, response when a form let's look first as this non-linguistic form, is surrounded by a shape which seems visually congruent compared to the situation where it is surrounded by an incongruent shape. This is uh, true for uh, non-letters, but it is not true for letters, which means that the processing of letter uh, is less, much less affected by the surrounding context, precisely because we have to do some more, uh, let's say, finer analysis, visual analysis for letters than non-letters. So, uh, we have, if, you, if we simplify uh, this description, we have what might be called holistic processing of non-letters, uh, uh, but 
analytic processing of letters. This was replicated in several studies, and what we did was to study both uh, dyslexic children and control groups, two groups of control, either uh, chronological age matched or uh, uh, reading level matched, uh, normally reading children. And also we compared, uh, we studied a group of illiterate adults. And uh, we saw that this differentiation between the processing of letters and non-letters develop enormously in dyslexic children because they are much more affected. As you can see here, this is the size of the congruence effect, so already the difference between the two uh, situations. For letters, they are the only ones uh, that show a congruence uh, effect, whereas you cannot see any congruence effect in uh, the two control groups uh, of children. And of course, this result is totally coherent with the beneficial effect of increasing interletter spacing of visual word recognition in young developmental uh, dyslexic, an effect which was already referred to by uh, Joe Ziegler. Now, uh, what is interesting is that the situation was totally different in illiterate adults, because illiterate adults, on the contrary, display already a differential congruence effect similar to literates, as you can see here. They have a huge congruence effect for non-letters, but no congruence effect for letters. And the size of their congruence effect for letters was uh, highly correlated to their letter knowledge. So the higher the letter knowledge, the smaller, as you can see, it's a negative correlation, the smaller the impact of the surrounding shape on letter processing. Now, uh, this uh, shows that in dyslexic, uh, there is something, some specific impairment there. Letter knowledge is not enough to develop this differentiation uh, because they have this positive congruence effect that nobody has shown, even illiterate people that know, who know uh, only some letters. Uh, what is interesting to note is that they were phonological dyslexic and that, uh, well, probably phonological dyslexia is due to poor phonological representations, which are in turn responsible for the impaired mapping between orthography and phonology. Therefore, it seems that letter processing is deviant from the start in dyslexic children. Now, uh, as a general conclusion before having a discussion and question, first, uh, merely observing a difference between dyslexic and age-matched control is not enough to establish a causal relation. And even a difference with reading level matched controls is sometimes not enough, as the latter are in fact younger, and there might be some difference due to maturation as well. So uh, it is uh, necessary to also have data on what I call missing literacy, which means illiterate adults, and also, of course, to find situations where dyslexic differ from illiterate adults. So thank you. And I propose you to have a discussion now. Portanto, nós temos agora um espaço para duas perguntas. A pessoa que queira dirigir a pergunta à mesa poderá se manifestar e levaremos o microfone. Ou a pessoa pode se dirigir também aqui à frente. Alguma pergunta? Aqui é a nossa terceira fila. Por favor. Ok. This is a question for Gislaine. This is the, the Annie. Okay. Would you please com, uh, comment a bit further about the uh, relationships or the importance of having a full screening of younger children 
so we would separate the types of deficits they have before even the the you know the the reading phase because as you are showing here we really need before starting uh, learning we need to have abilities related to the auditory and the visual system both will be very important when we finally start the reading process. And uh, that's what I would like you to comment a little bit more on this, because it seems that everybody is really concerned about the auditory system and the children who have visual abilities that are not fully developed might be in trouble too. And that's what you're saying here. We need to have both hemispheres fully prepared to learn how to read, at least in Portuguese, right? Would you please comment a little bit further what could be done to detect this student who might have a visual discrimination problem? Um, so you think that the, the, it was resonating a lot, so I did not got all the words. But uh, so you think that there is some children with difficulty in visual uh, perception of faces, for example? Si, si vous voulez, je peux parler aussi en français. Ce que je veux dire, excusez-moi. Oh, d'accord. Bien, je parle en français. <rire> je voudrais que, uh, savoir si vous pouvez parler un peu, un peu plus les deux là, parce qu'ils sont des très bien, vous avez beaucoup d'expérience. Entre les compas, qu'est-ce qu'il faut à nous là, qui sommes en train d'étudier ce sujet là, Uh, Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pour détecter, pour trouver les children qui ont plutôt un problème uh, visuel et non auditoriel, auditoriel, auditif, qui peut quand même uh, uh, poser des difficultés quand ils com commencent à apprendre à lire it, I think it's more a question ça va, for Joe. Ça va comme ça. <laughs> About the difference uh, on visual dyslexia relatively to phonological dyslexia. Uh, it's for you, Joe. <laughs> no, I have no response on that. I am not working on dyslexia. I am working on normal children development. So I can give you uh, insight about what normal children are uh, doing when they arrive to, 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 um, to reading uh, stage. And that, for example, what we have done, uh, what we have in the, in the experiment is that the most successful dyslexic readers, for example, were activating more the motor uh, representation of speech. So we have different systems. We always think that reading is a module, but in fact, the brain has a definitely region which are specified to do some task but they can uh, talk to each other and help each other when there is a difficulty. So we need to find a way to circumvent the problem. And so, for example, for uh, children who have difficulties to uh, hear the difference bet uh, between phonemes, it has been shown both on uh, uh, behavioral point of view, but also in MRI, that uh, using writing and using the movement, for example, to disambiguate mirror letters like B and D is very useful. And it's what we get in the MRI that the, ch the dyslexic children with more difficulties in, the, uh, uh, in hearing the uh, difference between this type of, of sound, which are closed sound and also closed letters, then they can help themselves by using the, in fact, the N representation, which is automatically activated in that case. So uh, I suppose that for uh, children who have visual difficulty, you should go through the auditory system to try to give uh, more uh, um, weight to this uh, component because we have all three components, the motor, the visual and the auditory component to arrive to the phoneme levels. So you can try to uh, use one or the other if one is, uh, is in difficulty. But for the moment, I do not have uh, experiments or studies that uh, really uh, look at this type, but I think it will be a, a bon sens, I don't know how to say that in English, to, uh, to use this type of approach. Especially because we see that already in babies. I am working a lot with babies, and babies are using all these uh, uh, um, 
component already to arrive to the phonology of their native language because at the beginning they are able to hear all the phonetic differences, or at least we can say that in a rough manner, and they will, to, they will have to converge to the correct phonology of their native language and they will use the visual uh, information of the articulatory movement and their own movement, motor movement, when they try to imitate both the sound and both the visual movement. So why do we don't, don't we use that also for reading? It would be a good idea to... It's, it's a question for both of you. Um, do you. Do you know of any, if this pattern of shifting the, the visual uh, perception, I would say, uh, in, in, in learners of non-alphabetic languages, like uh, the Chinese or, or even Japanese, if that same pattern happened? Or if it's related to the, the learning the letters of the alphabet? So the, the, the visual word for Maria has, uh, is also the same at the same uh, coordinates in the brain for uh, also for Japanese script, for example. I suppose that Stan will speak more uh, of that tomorrow, but uh, in fact, as soon as you learn a script, it seems that this region becomes uh, the best candidate to host this type of representation. So there is several factors, and we are just trying to understand which are the factors that constrain the representation of, of script to be in this particular region. So for example, the fact that we are using the fovea to, to recognize the words, uh, we are using the fovea to process faces, that's why they are arriving in the same way, in the same space. There is also the constraint that this region is also related to the parietal areas for uh, attention and to the language network on the left, if you have uh, um, uh, your oral language system on the left. Um, and so in that case, you will, have, you will have the same type of competition with faces also in Japanese and Chinese uh, readers. But there is not an experiment that I know that I've tested this uh, directly. Oh, maybe the Kimiro experiment. No? No. Uh, I f as far as I know, but maybe Stanislas know better, uh, there is no data showing, direct data showing competition with faces in other systems, but as long as you have the exactly the same coordinates for that particular visual world from area, you expect it, of course. As far as now, the data about competition are at least not published, but uh, maybe they will be soon. <laughs> Portanto, gostaríamos de agradecer a última pergunta, por favor. One last question. Okay. Uh, I'm an ophthalmologist, <laughs> and I work with learning deficits, visual, lear visual related learning deficits. That's why I'm making this type of questions. The question now does not refer to ophthalmology. I, what I've, we read now, or lately, is that there is a growing concern regarding the excessive use of, um, of uh, TVs and tablets in children in the pre-learning stage. And they are advising that we should avoid this. Instead of just showing the letters in the tablet video, we should make them also write the letters. The children who do more motor stimulation, stimulus, will do better when learning how to read. Would you please tell us about that too? Thank you. Mm, I do not have direct experience of that and there are several factors. If you spend more time on the tablet and the PC, you do not speak with your mother and, your, and you do not play with your with your friends and, and brother and sister, so there is a lot of problems. There is also the fact that, for example, for just uh, eye um, uh, myopa, myopi, how do you say that in English? Myopi, myopi, is increased both by the fact that you are more on the uh, on the screen, but also by the fact that you are more inside than outside, and that you need the, the direct exposure to the sun to develop your eye. So it's difficult to disentangle what is important in all these uh, uh, factors without doing an, uh, an experiment, a study, 
just uh, controlling all these factors to know what, is, what might be bad in a tablet. In another way, we know that there is some uh, uh, very efficient uh, teaching uh, uh, software using the tablet with feedback and with, uh, so, auditory feedback, yes. So, I mean, without any experiment, it's very difficult to, to answer in general all, uh, about the benefit or the, 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 the disadvantage to use tablets and PC and so on, sorry. I, w I would just like to add that uh, uh, Joe Ziegler insisted uh, very much on the importance of making the link between uh, orthography and phonology. And that's precisely the problem. If you show and leave uh, some game, let's say visual, purely visual game to a child, and then you leave uh, the child alone with that game, and that there is no mapping with phonology, it's useless. I mean, it's like, you know, trying to remember whatever kind of visual forms uh, the child won't learn to read. So it really depends on what is in the tablet. If it's a nice, very well-designed game using a mapping between phonology and orthography, and even better, some, you know, motor movement, but that's fantastic. I mean, it's the professor at home, so, of course, it, wouldn't, it would be bad to impede, if it impedes a child to play with a, uh, his or her uh, uh, sister or brother, but if it's sometimes playing that kind of, let's say, intelligent, well-designed game, that's fantastic. So it depends on the material, it does not depend on the support. Whatever be the support, I mean, it can be paper or, you know, a tablet or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's the method, it's the game by itself, uh, whether it's well designed or just, you know, for career. Portanto, gostaríamos de agradecer a participação da doutora Gislaine de Reine Lambert e a doutora Regine Kolinsky.